Hello, Bob Hamilton, the Social Energy Collective. I want to talk here about uh, system thinking, connectivity and social energy in the context of building a movement for change. So we hear a lot today about energy, how to save it, by preservation, reuse, repurposing, natural energy, solar, wind, wave and so on. So we want to talk here about things that are equally important that is the use of our social energy, connectivity and system thinking. So what about energy preservation in the social sphere? That is the energy we share socially in our community in all sorts of ways to do with thinking, the environment, education, politics, welfare planning, campaigning and so on. As well as the physical energy that is exerted in these activities. Social energy, the inner energy is an important area that tends to be forgotten about in activism. While many work with heads down in solitary confinement and campaign bubbles and work with procedures that bring about burnout while ignoring the connectivity that is needed and sharing the load in the process of building a movement for change. We each have a finite amount of energy to spend on things and without a systematic process, how do we channel and evaluate where that energy can be best used? Given the ferociousness of the neoliberal brute, we are challenging or we'll take all of the collective force we can muster to topple it. So we seem readily to understand this connectivity in other areas when we socialise with others in different interests, projects and hobbies. For instance, look at the system thinking in the growing community. While the whole process of permaculture and the growing of food attracts the gardener to a whole range of connected knowledge. From the science of soil to the study of time, the elements, geography, geology, physics, mechanics, DIY and a whole range of organising skills. Most gardeners tend to be generalists rather than specialists. They will happily talk about the weather and will not flinch if the subject has suddenly changed the building a fence, discussing the quality of topsoil or what needs to be in the ground when and where. The thing we want to explore is how it can be perplexing for many people and their ability to see or find the connections between actions and activities in the process of work together politically. This is an imperative not only in local life but now internationally and globally. We think it's a basic idea of how folks see the world around them or how they're educated to see the world around them. To see everything that happens as separate events. So we could look at it this way. There are two kinds of thinkers, event-orientated thinkers and system thinkers. Most of us tend to be event-orientated thinkers, thinking about one thing at a time. Gardeners, for instance, become system thinkers because so much of the thinking and activities in producing a crop relies on all sorts of information that will affect and direct activities for the successful yield. Why is this kind of thinking, we could ask, not more prevalent in our community and among activists? If change is to be our yield and we want to win it, we need to become more system thinkers. Rather than spontaneous event makers, particularly those that explodes into action, sucks up energy and peters out for lack of direction. System thinking is about looking at complex problems that involve helping many actors to see the bigger picture and not just their part of it. A kind of generalist view of the world or the community and how it functions around all of its component parts not just the ones we're involved in or interested in. System thinking is about looking at recurring problems or those that have been made worse by past attempts to fix them. Event thinking in the main only keeps us doing the same thing over and over and expecting something different to happen. 
like allowing banks to run the economy or people like Boris Johnson to run the country. System thinking is about looking at how an action affects or is affected by the environment, either the natural environment or the competitive environment, and all of the people within it, finding and acknowledging people's different insights and perspectives that will encourage them to join us. It's about looking at problems whose solutions are not yet obvious to us that we may be destined to repeat if we do not apply deep and thorough community-based research. We are confronted with all sorts of problems in all directions and they are added to every day. How does a person parse all of this information without going insane? How do we put things in the context of what needs to be done? What needs to be done first? What will the next important collective step needed to be in activism and the movement for change? The question is, how do all of our efforts lead to making economic and political change that will protect and sustain the historical, cultural and social change we have already won? No, this change did not arrive from above, out of the blue. It was won by trial and error, sacrifice and those that came before us. Those that are usually written out of the history books but nonetheless help to build agency and institutional change and economic and political advancement to protect it for ordinary people over generations. Like human rights have the obligation of protecting other human rights. We cannot protect our own in isolation. It is the obligation to others that in turn protects ourselves. We cannot afford to look inward. Fundamental change only happens when we look outwards and think together on bigger goals. Noam Chomsky makes the observation if you look over the developments in recent years, there's been severe retrogression in economic and political issues, but considerable progress in cultural and social issues. So the evidence points to this. We have an abundance of progressive groups, lots of interesting projects, better plans for economic stability and sustainability than the present system. Science is on our side. The evidence and most of the people agree with us but we're still not winning any substantial institutional change. We are not making the connections that build a critical mass under a strong and compelling story. Part of this is understanding or the lack of understanding of the things that connect us. We tend to think too much about what separates us, looking at our issues as being different. Ours is more important rather than what we have in common that could help to build a structured approach against the common enemy. There are so many reasons for this, some historical, we will look at in another episode. But for now, we could look at the types of change that are needed to stem the retrogression and economic and political issues that Chomsky is speaking of. There are cultural and social issues blooming and rising in all directions, as mentioned environment, race, poverty, gender, many young people coming aware of history and politics and all of this is good. But when it comes to protecting the culture and social issues that have been won, we need to strive towards making institutional change. That is system change of the banks, the corporations, the elite empires that are built on and rely on maintaining the poverty of others. To change that system, we need to create a system or call it a compelling story of our own to replace the elite story. Because without a collective effort to force institutional change, we will keep having to fight the same issues over and over again. To build political and economic change, we need to find the connections. There are as many ideas in doing this as there are people and issues in the community. And many of them take up rightly all of the time and energy of those involved in trying to resolve them. 
The problem of our day evolves around the struggles against the ongoing development of the neoliberal project, a system that has been developed over the last 50 years through the systematic destruction of the social base of unionisation, internationalism, solidarity and the commons. And as Chris Hedges reminds us of what sits at the apex of this class war when he speaks of the US and the UK could follow. He says, we now live in a nation where doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, governments destroy freedom, the press destroys information, religion destroys morals and our banks destroy the economy. These are multiple attacks that we can't fight without some common principles of humanity that are driving for a decent life for people. Completely aside from the party politics, saviours, sex, and ideologies. The other thing that could be added to the list of the ongoing neoliberal project is the balkanisation of the left into manageable separate issue groups, which economist Michael Hudson refers to, saying, The financial strategy of this class war is to popularise identity politics, promoting voters to think of themselves as women ethnic or racial minorities or sexual categories LBGTQ instead of economic categories as wage earners, debtors and or renters. True identity politics, he says, should begin with economic class consciousness, solidarity and mutual aid. There can be little promotion of group self-interest without this. So, the movement for change is not about the individualistic situations that we are in, the interests and groups we choose and the lifestyles we lead, clothes we wear or where we get them, what eco-friendly brands we use, whether we give to charity, speak truth to power, have a certain expertise, vote, are affiliated with a party for change or are even active community members. These things can also be manipulated to maintain the status quo unless they are affiliated to a wider overarching vision. So it's about whether we want to join a movement for sustainable institutional change and understand what we need to do to achieve it. It's about understanding the important and critical connections that are involved in this work. At this point, it's not so much about our individual concerns it's about presenting the kind of society where these things could be realised. That does not mean stop what we are doing, but keep asking ourselves the question, is what I'm about to do strengthening the web of connections to change, or is it going to weaken it? Because unless these connections are made, a threat to economic and political change will remain nominal and manageable. And worth repeating, we will simply continue to fight the same battles over and over with no end in sight. Today, Today we have the opportunity to do this if you can rise to the challenge, even more so in the international sense, as we are reminded it is about internationalism or extinction. We are no longer alone in the world and our work needs to reflect on the butterfly analogy of how and what we do and the decisions we make will affect so many others. Our survival as a species is no more about what we can have but what we can give up, about developing and finding pleasure in thought and creativity and in less harmful things as the stimuli rather than the perpetual consumption that keeps the engine of neoliberalism running and the elite in charge. Arundhati Roy captures the time we live in when she says, Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality, trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists and in the midst of this terrible despair it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine 
we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historical pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcass of our prejudices and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. But the ability to win that fight will be in our ability to pivot while remaining aware of our anchors, avoiding the sideshow of party politics while building and harnessing our social energy to the collective task at hand. And not as egotists and individuals, but as organisers and responsible leaders. But commitment and passion without organisational structure and vision will not get us very far. To conclude, as Margaret Wheatley reminds us, our willingness to acknowledge that we only see half the picture creates the conditions that make us more attractive to others. Because if we are to avoid dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our data banks and dead ideas, we need to forget that and think as one, as human beings, by opening ourselves to the wider cosmos and ideas that can take us forward.